Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. And if you just showed up at this video, you are in my book playlist where we are going through the book titled Looking Out for Number One from Robert Ringer. It was listed as the New York Times number one best-selling motivational book of all time. The author provides insights on how to get from where you are now to where you want to be in life. Before I get started, I want to say thank you so much for not only you joining me here at this video, but for all the subscribers. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and for you who have sent me super thanks. I really appreciate your kindness and thoughtfulness and valuing the effort that I'm putting on bringing these uh, books to you. Okay, now before we dive into this next chapter, a brief um, overview of the last few chapters. And of course, you can go to my book playlist and access them there if you just found us at this video. But looking out for number one is not about me, me, me. It is really about understanding that if you're using your time, your energy, and your efforts to focus on others without taking time for you, then you have no energy for yourself. And it comes from that place, that place of love, the place of service, where if you take care of yourself, you will have more than enough to give to others. As you improve yourself, as you feel great and achieve things, you want and have more to offer. Then also in chapter two and three, the uh, conversation moved on to the reality hurdle. Living in the reality, not living in a place of illusion and allows you to actually focus on how to move from where you're at now to where you want to be. And the intimidation hurdle was also really enlightening from the point of view that sometimes we do allow ourselves to be pressured by our peers, pressured by a group, pressured by family and friends and also even the governments and also pressure from fear or uh, old dogmas and as we overcome these things we actually let go of that what intimidates and open up and see that you know what that you are possible that what you want in life is possible so with that i'm going to uh, go ahead get ready now to move on to the next chapter sit back relax Looking out for number one, how to get from where you are now to where you want to be in life by Robert Ringer. Dedicated to the hope that somewhere in our universe, there exists a civilization whose inhabitants possess a sole dominion over their own lives, where every individual has the ability to recognize and the courage to acknowledge reality and where governments as we know them, do not exist. Chapter 4. The Crusade Hurdle By crusade, used interchangeably in this chapter with the word cause. I am referring to the platform of any group, regardless of its purported objectives, that calls for aggressive action to advance an idea or eliminate an existing idea or circumstance. Perhaps you are presently involved in such a group, though you may not have thought about it as a crusade. I am not against the existence of causes per se, because everyone certainly has a right to pursue whatever interest he so desires, so long as he does not commit aggression against others in the process. Further, I would have to concede that many causes have noble objectives, the best examples of which are private charities whose financial records are open to the general public. Most causes, however, are not noble. Worse, many use aggressive tactics to such an extreme that they are a menace to peaceful individuals who just want to be left alone. There is a seemingly endless supply of proclaimed good causes one can support. So the first problem is to figure out which one are ones to join. Some of the better known causes we hear about almost daily involve debates about climate change, saving endangered species, preservation of the earth's rainforest, pornography on the internet, racial profiling, legalization of drugs, pro-choice versus pro-life, euthanasia, gay marriage, gun control, and special rights for the handicapped, elderly, illegal immigrants, and numerous other groups. 
the diaper corpse, all people under 25 years of age and those over 30 who still play with rattles, is responsible for many of the most absurd movements we hear about almost daily. Were such movements not given publicity by the media, most of their would-be causes would undoubtedly die swiftly. Young people are amazingly flexible. They can be militant about the environment one day, socialist the next, then, who knows, the merits of mating mice with giraffes. One of the most disturbing things about crusades is that they tend to become ends in themselves. The official objective of the group somehow gets lost in the rearranging of the facts, the endless bureaucracy of its corporate structure, and the never-ending bashing of its foes. With all this going on, the crusade never quite seems to get around to its stated purpose. That's why the all-or-nothing approach is usually favored, i.e., you must accept all tenets of the group, no questions asked. Mass movement leaders throughout history have been well aware that outside interests detract from the energies needed to keep a movement going full steam. Whether a crusade is created by the diaper corpse or irrational adults, its true value should be judged on the basis of logic, reality, and fact. And even if its stated purpose passes the test of reason, a movement is still unjustified if it interferes with the lives of non-members. An unsound crusade of any kind is a major hurdle that can complicate your life in numerous ways. And avoiding such complications begins with understanding that the concept of a group action is fundamentally unsound. The cookie cutter phenomenon. One of the most fascinating things about crusades is that no matter what their members purport to believe in, their structures are remarkably similar. Throughout history, the nature of crusades may have changed, but their basic characteristics have remained intact. Some of the more common components of virtually all crusades are described below. Grouping and tagging with an official stamp. All crusades put labels on individuals, which is reason enough to avoid them. But unlike general grouping and tagging, Crusades are puffed up in stature by the use of official sounding names. A common sense, whether rational or irrational, unites those involved, which sounds relatively harmless on the surface. The problem is that it erroneously assumes that just because you support a cause, its leader speaks on your behalf which means you involuntarily lose your individuality the moment you take part in group action. Organizations themselves would be irrelevant to non-members if they did not undertake crusades. To use a hypothetical example, a tennis club is a perfectly harmless group so long as its members stick to playing tennis with one another. But if they suddenly decide it's their duty to make everyone in the world play tennis, then embark on a campaign to solicit new members through pressure tactics, the tennis club is transformed into a tennis crusade. Though the above example may sound a bit far-fetched, it is precisely how a seemingly harmless group transforms itself into a crusade. It all starts when members of the group begin to interfere in the lives of others by pressuring them to join or by attempting to force them to do or not do something that will bring their actions in line with the group's objectives. And that's the point at which the group threatens to become a dangerous obstacle to your happiness. You should steadfastly refuse to relinquish your individuality to any group of people just because it happens to have a particular characteristic in common with you, whether it be sex, skin color, religious affiliation, or occupation. Be careful about allowing such people to refer to you as one of us. 
You should insist on remaining an individual and showing the world what you, as a unique entity, have to offer. It is dangerous to accept the blanket characteristics of any group. If you're a woman, you're different than any other woman in the world. If you're an elderly person, there's no other elderly person exactly like you. If your skin color is brown, there isn't another brown person in existence with the same traits you possess. Plain and simple. If you're a human being, you're a one of a kind. Which is why you should never allow the crusade hurdle to become a barrier between you and your efforts to demonstrate your uniqueness to the world. Distortion. Virtually every movement excels in the distortion or deletion of relevant information. Those promoting a crusade quite naturally paint only their side of the picture, so one should not be particularly impressed with the seeming worthiness of any cause or the reasonableness of any group's sales pitch. More often than not, such a sales pitch is based on false premises, so it is incumbent on you to challenge all premises. Also, remember that figures do lie. Some figures bandied about crusaders are just plain false. So never make the mistake of assuming what you hear is correct just because the information is in print or is given in an authoritative manner. And even when figures are correct, they can still be used out of context to cleverly make one's case. Emphasis on the future. Not only are the motivations for becoming involved in most causes questionable, but causes rarely achieve their stated goals. In fact, if causes had to rely on their track records alone, they would find it much more difficult to attract supporters. The most obvious examples of this are crusades to end war and poverty. Judging from 6,000 years of recorded history, poverty would appear to be a natural consequence of the ebb and flow of human events, particularly those related to government capriciousness. Poverty is a subjective condition, but we can certainly all agree that extreme forms of poverty are found only where the most tyrannical forms of government exist. When people are free to pursue their own interests, wealth is created in the process. In so-called democratic countries, no one who is willing to work is poor in the third world sense of the word. As to peace movements, short of self-styled saviors conquering every country on earth and holding in check those with aspirations to invade other countries, world peace is not possible. Crusaders can preach peace to their heart's content, but their words will have no effect whatsoever on the next Hugo Chavez, Osama bin Laden, or Ahmadinejad. And for every malevolent individual who today holds the reign of power, there are thousands of individuals as bad or worse waiting in the wings for the opportunity to grab those reins. Given these realities, an emphasis on the future has been an important tool of crusaders for centuries. So long as success is projected far into the future, dedication to the cause can be justified. The less a movement offers in the present and the more it offers in the future, the better chances of success. Most crusades would fizzle out rather quickly if they promised immediate results. So if you intend to start a movement of your own, I would suggest that you give your enlistees a far out target date for achieving the crusade's objectives. The year 2140 might be a nice date to shoot for. If you can sell them on a date far enough into the future, you may be able to keep your members in line throughout your lifetime. Organization. Critical to the success of crusades is the degree to which they are corporately organized. The better the planning and structure of a group, the more it gives the illusion of being a living entity. That, in turn, makes it easier to strip its followers of their individuality. Individual characteristics, after all, pose a threat to the group's purported objective, 
meaning the objective of its, of its leader. So the better organized the movement, the more odd its members are likely to be. The devil. Most mass movements find it necessary to create a devil. If there is a crusade to preserve the coastline, the devil is the individual who doesn't want his beach property confiscated for the public good. If it's a crusade to increase corporate responsibility, the devil is the corporate executive. Heretics were the Inquisition's devil, Jews were Hitler's devil, and today, America and Israel comprise the big and little devils for much of the Arab world. If no other devil is convenient, a group leader will settle for just about anyone who doesn't belong to his movement. The good guys are those involved. The bad guys are those who haven't yet seen the light. The use of force. Perhaps the most irrational aspect of all when it comes to getting involved in a cause is that many of them resort to force to achieve their ends. What actually happens in most cases is that crusaders appeal to the government to force people to act in accordance with their desires. Often, and this aggression comes in the form of lobbying government officials for special rights, i.e. pressuring politicians to pass new laws to help them achieve their objectives, knowing that the power holders have the guns and manpower to make certain these objectives turned laws will be enforced and special rights for some always violate the right of others. Whenever a group is formed for the purpose of including politicians to create a new law, what it really amounts to when stripped of its slogans and pretenses is appealing to the government to impose the group's personal beliefs on others. And though most people have strong beliefs about one or more causes, such beliefs represent nothing more than personal opinions and as such are morally inferior to individual liberty. If people are serious about living in a free society, liberty must be given a higher priority than all other objectives, including any and all causes that certain people may deem to be noble. Unfortunately, there will always be misguided individuals who arrogantly believe that achieving their desired objectives justifies virtually any means. This is especially true of those who sermonize about world peace, the environment, eradication of poverty, or such abstracts as social justice and shared prosperity. All too often, the end game for the leader of a cause is repression of individual freedom. As Nobel Prize novelist and poet Anatoly France so rightfully pointed out, quote, those who have given themselves the most concern about the happiness of peoples have made their neighbors very miserable, end quote. Relying on persuasion to take something from others or to force to do something they don't want to do is a difficult proposition. A well-organized crusade makes it much easier and safer to violate the rights of others via the threat of government force. Hiding behind the strong arm of government blurs the reality that such interference is being perpetrated by one's neighbors. If members perceive that an abstract entity, the group, is committing aggression, they can morally justify it by contending that it benefits society as a whole. You should refuse to relinquish your individuality under pressure from any group whose members might all happen to desire a similar social change. And if a group's intention is to bring about social change through the threat of government force, that, of and by itself, is an excellent reason not to become involved. The use of force for anything other than self-defense is never morally justified. Slogans 
The deployment of slogans is another common denominator of most movements. As a general rule, the less a slogan actually says, think, hope and change, the greater its appeal. Slogans are employed because to the unthinking individual, they appear on the surface to be interchangeable with the fact. Love it or leave it makes it a fact that the country belongs to those making the statement and that you are under an obligation either to agree with their political views or to move to another country. The more clever the slogan, the less the crusader need concern himself with facts. The spectacle. The spectacle goes hand in hand with slogans when it comes to stirring the emotions of crusade members. From the smallest protest march to the most elaborate parade or ceremony, spectacles are an essential element of most crusades, so much so that they often can be the glue that holds together a shaky structure that would otherwise crumble. When reality threatens to shatter a group member's faith, a spectacular ritual, however meaningless, can be the ideal antidote for keeping him in line. Political rallies are perfect examples of this phenomenon, with balloons and confetti falling from the ceiling, music blaring, and intellectually comatose people laughing, shouting, and wildly thrusting vote for signs into the air. Ditto with military parades before, during, and after a war. The greater the spectacle, the more effective it is likely to be. The spectacle is an escape from reality, a vehicle for pretending. Profile of a Crusade Leader The prototype of a Crusade leader may not seem very different from that of other neurotics who have stumbled into your life over the years. But the one characteristic you can always count on is an insatiable ego. The crusade leader believes he can save the world by imposing his will on others. Rest assured, however, that if his own life were more meaningful, his burning conviction for his cause would be radically diminished. As Eric Hoffer pointed out, quote, a man is likely to mind his own business when it is worth minding. When it is not, he takes his mind off his own meaningless affairs by minding other people's business." End quote. The leaders of so-called mass movements in particular have a tremendous need to have their egos assuaged. A study of mass movement leaders of the past reveals a distinct pattern. Rejection in other fields of endeavor, usually resulting in frustration and self-contempt, which in turn manifest themselves in hatred of others, extreme vanity, and almost without fail, absolute moralitis. Sounds like a pretty good description of Adolf Hitler, doesn't it? Because of the mindset of the group's leader, one has to look carefully beyond the slogans and rituals for his real motives. All too often, the head of a movement feeds his own glory and power at the expense of his followers. If necessary, needs can be manufactured in order to keep an organization going. Today, there are probably more self-anointed leaders than ever before who are masters at creating needs. They are able to mask the truth in such a way as to create the perception that their actions are aimed at improving the plight of one group or another. Above all, most crusade leaders find it easy to be harsh with others and are usually intolerant and cruel towards those who do not see things their way. In truth, the would-be reformer is a vain individual who is presumptuous enough to believe that everyone should be forced to agree with his views. As Napoleon observed, quote, Vanity made the revolution. Liberty was only a pretext. End quote. When carefully scrutinized, the crusade leader usually turns out to be nothing more than an absolute moralist with a banner. Profile of a habitual joiner. Without followers, of course, a crusade leader would not get very far. 
To snare his disciples, he has to compete with every other crusade leader for available bodies. Because a joiner is a joiner is a joiner. Although no joiner worth his crusading salt would ever admit it, even to himself. The cause is really secondary to him. To ease the heated competition among recruiters, crusade leaders should agree to hold an annual draft much like the owners of a professional sports teams do, to divvy up each year's crop of talent. As teeny boppers come of age, they could then be drafted in an orderly fashion by all the crusade leaders who agree to be bound by the draft. As it now stands, however, champions of various causes have to fight off competitors to make the best possible impression on the pool of prospective joiners. To do so, They employ a variety of motivational techniques for appealing to a wide spectrum of desires and emotional traits. It is essential that a crusade leader understand the would-be followers' motives for joining, which can range from companionship to a desire to conform, to ego satisfaction, to escape from personal responsibility for his own success and happiness, to a genuine belief in the worthiness of the crusade, or at least the belief that he believes. Following is a discussion of four of the more common motivations for joining a crusade. Boredom. High on the list of motivating factors is boredom. If you are supporting more than one or two presumably noble causes, it might be a good idea to recheck your premises If anyone needs to get a life, it's a professional cause advocate. When the same names and faces keep popping up in conjunction with new causes, it makes one a bit suspicious of what some of these people do for a living. Observing some of the more well-known serial crusaders flitting from one picket line to another, volunteering their comments on why every perceived societal problem is a racial issue, and jetting from one country to another to hug communist dictators and terrorists, one cannot help to be curious about who keeps them in new suits, not to mention their air travel and hotel accommodations. Guilt and Envy Both of these negative emotions play an important role in determining the success of crusade when it comes to attracting new supporters. Succeed in causing a person to feel guilty enough or bring to the surface the envy that has long been simmering inside him, and the chances are pretty good that he'll support your cause without engaging in a great deal of due diligence. Guilt and envy are two of the most dangerous motives for joining a cause. Self-righteousness Self-righteousness is arrogance at its worst. I concur with Thoreau's view that very few people who claim virtuosity are really deserving of the mantle. We've already been over the problem of others wanting to set moral standards for you. So let me just underscore it with regard to causes. Living a life guided by rational action requires that you be in control of your mind beginning with the construction and maintenance of your personal code of ethics. It goes without saying that just as it is arrogant for anyone to preach morality to you, so too is it arrogant for you to preach morality to others, whether directly or under the guise of a cause. It is in your best interest to fight the urge to set moral standards for your fellow men. Because not only does such action tend to evolve into aggression, it also takes time away from working on important issues that are your business. Ignorance. Lastly, a factor that joiners of all but the most noble of causes have in common is a general ignorance of the facts. Arrogance and ignorance go hand in hand. From whence comes the expression arrogance of the ignorant? Given how often so-called experts turn out to be wrong in their predictions about the future, one might be justified in concluding that ignorance is 
almost a necessity for arrogance to exist. Environmentalists are notorious for this flaw, often hopping from one pet issue to another as new information surfaces that undermines their causes. Though there have been an endless stream of dire predictions about such things as global warming, which conveniently took the place of the global cooling scare that ultimately was annihilated by the facts. Depletion of the Earth's rainforest, even though the number of trees in the ground actually becomes greater every year. And the effects of ozone holes in the atmosphere. The Earth seems to go right on spinning. Life expectancy rates continue to increase, and the standard of living in industrialized nation continues to climb upward. In summation, the joiner is a frustrated individual who needs to be needed to an excessive degree. Self-contempt is a common trademark among joiners, which makes it easy for the joiner to lockstep with his leader in expressing contempt for others. Previous failures drive him to remove the burden of personal responsibility from his own shoulders, which he believes he can accomplish by becoming lost in the group. When he becomes a faceless body in a common cause, the pressure for personal success is lifted and he is ripe to become a full-fledged absolute moralist. The promised glory of the future is precisely what takes his mind off his current misery. The group becomes a sort of narcotic for him by lessening his pain. The professional crusader also finds it safer to vent his feelings of hostility under the banner of a group. When lost in the faceless depths of a movement, it is not he, but the group, that is interfering in the life of others. Because of his own perceived sacrifices, cruelty and hatred toward others become justifiable. Crusades are a source of perverse freedom, the freedom to be harsh and intolerant towards others, the freedom to pressure those who are perceived to be enemies, and the freedom to interfere in people's lives without feeling guilty about it. The pathological joiner must also possess the ability to ignore all rational arguments that threatened to undermine the cause. This ostrich-like mindset gives the joiner the strength to confront the obstacles and contradictions that constantly arise. By his refusal to see or hear anything that does not fit in with the Crusades narrative, such obstacles and contradictions simply fail to exist. It is understandable, then, that the most successful Crusades have been those that are most effective at keeping their followers separated from reality. Because crusades have so much in common, the chronic joiner finds it easy to jump from one cause to another. After all, the basic characteristics of most crusades are indistinguishable and the traits of their members similar. A crusade hopping is easy to justify. You may be acquainted with someone who is group addicted. If so, ask yourself, how many times that person has embraced a new cause and each time proclaimed, in effect, that this cause is different than all of the other causes he has previously supported. An easy way to check yourself against vulnerability to the crusade hurdle is to examine the number of times you have jumped on new causes as well as how fast and how radically you have made such jumps. Habitual joiners tend to jump often, quickly and radically, because they are victims of the confused thinking theory, which states, When a person's philosophy takes a sudden and dramatic shift in direction, his reasoning is suspect because, one, if his previous beliefs were foreign to his present viewpoints, his original thinking must have been flawed. If so, how can he trust his reasoning power with regard to his current beliefs? And two, if his original thinking was sound, his past beliefs should have been correct. If so, his reasons for joining the new crusade must be flawed. While the outward characteristics of all movements are similar, the nature of their stated objectives can be quite different. If you're in the habit of making radical swings in your basic beliefs, the crusade hurdle is still in your path. 
But if you're on the looking out for number one track, the evolution of your belief system should continue in the same general direction. Carefully monitor your thoughts whenever you stumble onto a new group or movement that stirs your emotions, especially if its cause seems to be the answer to all of the world's perceived ills. A Rational View of Crusades Two of the more important keys to getting a person to join a crusade is a lack of knowledge and or rational thought. If everyone who joined a movement, cause, or crusade carefully analyzed the realities of the group's purpose in advance, I strongly suspect that most crusades throughout history would have disappeared without a whimper for lack of membership. There are many reasons why group action is irrational from the individual standpoint, and perhaps the most important one is that the group may never accomplish its intended purpose, in which case the joiner is apt to become bitter about the time and energy he has wasted, time and energy that could have been used to better his own life. In part, this explains why so many hardcore followers of crusades come from the diaper corpse. Once an individual has some real-world experience under his belt, he is far experienced in workings of life and thus far more hesitant to waste his finite supply of time on a cause that others happen to believe is worthy. In many respects, there is not strength in numbers, but weakness. Suppose you want to help the poor. Charity is a noble activity, assuming you can afford the time and or money to engage in it. If it makes you feel good to help those who are less fortunate than you, by all means do so. But rather than waste time becoming involved in the muddled bureaucracy of some organization where you would have to confer with others over such questions as who qualifies as poor and what precisely should be done for such people, Would it not be easier, faster, and more efficient to make all necessary decisions unilaterally and take immediate action yourself? All you would need to do is decide which person or persons you deem to be poor, then decide how much of your money you would like them to have. Best of all, you could personally deliver the money to them. No middleman. Just think, you could do all this without having to stop and consult with anyone else. Having accomplished your purpose, you could then go on to other pursuits without harassing friends, neighbors, or strangers about your beliefs. Simple, efficient, immediate results. The kind of results that are all but impossible to achieve through group action. If you acted in precisely the above manner, I would be inclined to believe you if you told me you had a desire to help the poor. But if you tried to solicit me to join a charitable organization to help those who are in financial need, I would look you over real carefully and ask a whole bunch of questions that you probably either couldn't answer or would prefer not to. Since it's very easy to help others if that is your true purpose, I'm skeptical of the motives of do-gooders who form organizations to carry out charitable and public good projects. The first thing I look for in such people is a big ego. Second, I look for an ulterior motive behind their purported intent. The next time you're tempted to work for a charity or even contribute to one, I suggest you ask yourself the following questions. Do I have first-hand knowledge of exactly how the money I am raising is going to be spent? Can I be certain it is being used to help those the group purports to be aiding? And if so, do I really know what percentage of the money after bureaucratic waste will actually end up in the hands of the designated recipients? People who gave to charities targeted to help impoverished Haitians after that country's catastrophic earthquake in 2010, have been dismayed to discover that almost nothing has been done to help those most ravaged by the quake. Even if a crusade is successful, 
and keeping in mind that successful is a subjective term, you have no way of knowing that you will live long enough to witness the results. To work on a crusade all your life and not be around to see its fruition would be a cruel fate indeed. From this perspective, the crusade's emphasis on the future can be seen for the sham it really is. This, I believe, is the key that holds the Islamic death and destruction movement together. The stated mission of this hate crusade is to eliminate from the face of the earth every infidel. Since this objective can never be accomplished, there is no pressure for a final result from mindless followers. As to rewards, radical Islam is perhaps the perfect crusade because martyrs are led to believe that their return on time invested comes in the afterlife, which means there's no danger of their ever being able to convey to other followers the reality that things didn't work out quite the way they expected. But there is an even worse fate possible. What if the group's stated purpose is accomplished during your lifetime, but the results turn out to be very different from what you had in mind all those years that you were donating your valuable time and energy resources to help bring them about? Although most groups never come to close to achieving their stated objectives, disillusionment is the rule rather than the exception for those that do. The reason for this is obvious. Given that each person in an organization is unique, your perception of the group's purpose and the perception of the group's leader, not to mention the perception of every other member of the group, are likely to be quite different. You can be certain that the masses in the early years of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia were not envisioning the same results as the leaders who proclaimed that communism would free them. As in George Orwell's 1984, they had no idea that the freedom promised by the Bolshevik leaders would translate into slavery. Ditto with Castro's Cuba, Mao's China, and Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam. Finally, the hardest reality of all for the diaper corpse to grasp. Your own personal growth in knowledge and reasoning power may shed a whole new light on a cause you once thought to be worthwhile. New facts continually arise that make the glitter off a once seemingly worthy crusade. The great author and futurist Alvin Toffer, Future Chalk, The Third Wave, Power Shift, wrote that when he was a Marxist in his late teens and early twenties, he, like many young people, thought he had all the answers. He went on to write, I soon learned that my answers were partial, one-sided, and obsolete. Thus, in most cases, joining a crusade is hard to justify. If you join a crusade just to conform, you are not acting rationally. If you join for companionship, you're being dishonest with the other members of the group, unless that is the group's stated purpose. If you join for ego satisfaction, you're on dangerous ground because the more you feed your ego, the hungrier it gets, which only leads you further from a rational course of action. And if you join out of frustration, you're taking the easy way out in order to avoid real solutions to your problems, not to mention inviting additional frustration into your life as a result of not being able to get others to see things your way. The Efficiency of Individual Action Perhaps the most critical element that professional cause advocates fail to factor into their crusade equations is technical advance. Not only does technology continually render perceived crisis irrelevant, it also continues to raise the living standards of potential cause joiners. In our modern age of prosperity, nothing annoys crusade leaders more than the realization that otherwise perfectly good prospects for their causes are relaxing in the backyards of their suburban homes, grilling steaks on the barbecue and watching their kids splash around in their 10 by 20 foot swimming pools. 
Convincing these folks that they're being exploited by the rich is a pretty tough sell. Even if you believed in a group's objectives and actually had first-hand knowledge of the facts, it still would be less complicated and more efficient to act on your own rather than in concert with others. In addition, as previously pointed out, collective action encourages one to avoid personal responsibility. As with the charity example discussed earlier, if you feel strongly about a cause, by acting alone, you can start doing something about it immediately. But if your approach is to build a sophisticated organization structure to promote the cause, you may never get around to your stated purpose. The nature of such organizational efforts, endless politics, debates over differences of opinion, funding, and other bureaucratic obstacles can easily use up all your available time and energy. If you feel a sincere urge to take action for or against something, don't waste time trying to convert others to your way of thinking. If you believe in a particular philosophy, you should be too busy living it to spend time trying to convert others to your way of thinking. If you have a desire to have your ideas heard, why not write a book about them or offer to lecture on those ideas for a fee? Above all, don't feel that you have a moral obligation to help people see the light. Chances are pretty good that you have enough problems of your own that require your full time and attention. Life burdens us with too many non-productive projects as it is. From brushing our teeth to getting our hair cut to filling our gas tanks. So why look for more? The fact is that the world doesn't have problems. People have problems. Notwithstanding all the real or imagined world disaster crisis, the reality is that you have it within your power to lead a fulfilling, meaningful life. Starting right now. Perceived disasters that may or may not make their appearances in your lifetime or ever should not be allowed to rob you of that opportunity, nor should those who choose to spend their time crusading to save the world from such perceived disasters. Looking out for number one requires that you maintain control over your actions rather than allowing the desires of a group to determine them for you. Unfortunately, millions of individuals have to spend a significant amount of their valuable time and energy fending off those who constantly try to interfere in their lives through crusades. Don't allow yourself to be emotionally swept along by the herd instinct, the rhetoric of absolute moralists, or the slogans of a mindless band of people. Staunchly refuse to yield to the intimidating pressures of others to become involved in group action. A group may dwell endlessly on how it can help you become a happier individual, but such claims are meaningless. Why? Because the very premise of group action negates that possibility. When you contribute time and subordinate your interest to those of an organization, you lose not only your individuality, but also precious, irreplaceable hours that could be spent confronting obstacles in your own life. To a rational individual, the farther off the promised results, the more obvious it is that perpetuation of the group itself is the real objective of the leader. So when the next crusader comes knocking at your door, babbling about this or that crisis, do yourself a favor and advise him to get a real job. Get out of the way of those who are creating value for others and allow entrepreneurial creativity to continue expanding the frontiers of modern technology and improving the living standards of people worldwide. 
using your time and energy to help promote a cause that advocates the use of force to make others accept an agenda that certain individuals believe is right is far removed from the noble objective of having a legitimate purpose in life, being passionate about that purpose and taking continual and constructive action to achieve it. If you wish to make a serious contribution to world peace and prosperity, I suggest you use your time and energy to improve the one person over which you not only have control, but the moral authority to control you. If you do decide to become involved in a crusade, just make certain that you do so for rational reasons, your rational reasons. And be doubly certain that you are honest with yourself about your motives. Any rational motive is fine, so long as you understand exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. Also, be careful not to chastise others for not becoming involved in a cause that you believe to be worthy. How others spend their time and what they believe in is none of your business. When you start being so presumptuous as to concern yourself with getting others to become involved in a cause you believe in, you are taking the first step toward becoming a crusader. On the other hand, if you make the decision to focus on your own life rather than becoming involved in a crusade in an attempt to solve some group's perception of societal problem. I wish to extend my personal thanks to you for eliminating yourself as a burden to the rest of mankind, as well as my congratulations for your success in clearing the crusade hurdle. End of chapter. If you haven't done so yet, hit that like button. I welcome you to subscribe to the channel. If you like what you're hearing here in this particular book, please do share it with your friends. And let's head over to the next video where we continue on with the book titled Looking Out for Number One, How to Get from Where You Are Now to Where You Want to Be in Life.